Gooch. No, Gooch. Gooch, they like to, they like, they like to play out of the back. Oh, first of all, <laughs> I, I, first of all I know Bees ain't talking. Bees had to move back in his in his career. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Crack Podcast. <laughs> Alright, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to The Crack Podcast, season three. I'm so happy to finally, finally, finally be on here. Uh, my name is Mauricio Mookie Wilson. I want to introduce my two co-hosts. Let's give a big round of applause, please, for Gucci on Yewu and Demarcus Easley. Bees, where you been? Anywhere and everywhere. I'm back <laughs> in Houston now, but uh, but nah, man, I've been. Um, it's been good. It's been good. Um, been back and forth to Fort Wayne a lot. Uh, Is it e- every my, every time I see bees, or I call bees, or I get a text from him, he's in a different state, different city. <laughs> I thought Gooch. I thought he was on the world tour. I thought he became wait, wait, a wait. rapper. He you had a mixtape out. You get you you get calls from bees. You, you still, hey, you still mad about that Clemson shit, ain't you? Yeah, this, this, this man, I, I do see him everywhere. This man goes to my alma mater. <laughs> it's up everybody except for me. Let Yo, me. I text you. You didn't answer the phone. So I then that's when I, I put it. I, I, I shouted out Stu. You should answer the phone. He intentionally tagged everybody in his post, minus me. <laughs> you know Gucci is sensitive, but Bees, you was on a college tour, man. What were you doing? Man, I was looking at, looking for some players, man. Uh, you know, Fort Wayne FC, we got a big season coming up, so uh, we want to kind of get ahead of the ahead of the game. Uh, my coach, uh, Mike Avery, and I, and uh, just see what was out there throughout the country. Um, you know, we went. He he did he did the West Coast, the Midwest. I did the East Coast and a little bit of the South. So uh, we just try to cover our um, you know cover areas. You know, we went everywhere. It wasn't just the Division One school, Division Two, II, Division Three, NAIA. Uh, we, we saw a lot of a lot of football uh, over the offseason through the, this this fall, but it's been good, man. I'm uh, I'm blessed to be in this position, so you know, excited for the season to come. And just to be clear, this is for Fort Wayne FC. Where are you guys playing? Yeah, Fort Wayne FC. I mean, where who else are gonna be for? Where, well, I got a new job. I got I got a new job that I don't know about. Unfortunately, everybody doesn't know about particularly what's going on in your particular life. Yeah, you know tell, what I'm saying? Tell us what's going on, Bees. Damn. That, that is what's going on. For, Secret hey, Squirrel. Se- Secret so Squirrel over here, man. He's a professional scout right now. Hey, I, is, hey right? I'm, a, I'm a scout. Uh, I, I recruit. Um, I'm the head of the business. I'm in the, uh, the sporting operations, uh, the football operations. So I'm doing a little bit of everything and part owner. So Dan, you uh, you Bob Bradley and Bruce Arena all in one. Yeah. <laughs> Straight up. So I got my I got my hand in everything, but just but it's good though. I, I get to learn different areas of the club. You know, what I'm saying how it's ran and um, just just learning as I go. But uh, but it's fun and to be in, like I said, always like I always say to to be back in my hometown and to do it there and uh, hopefully um, you know bring professional football to to my home city is uh you know is special. So. How important was that for you, man? I mean, leaving your hometown at 17 years old to play professional and actually coming back and bringing something that's brand new. Um, is, this, is this like a dream for you? Shit, I left at 15. Mm-hmm. And, that's right. You know, I get that question. I get that question a lot. People are like, oh, have you ever, did you ever dream about having a, you know, this, you know, soccer club or team or stadium come true? I'm like, nah. <laughs> I'm like, there's no way, it, there's no way here I thought that, in 2022 or 20, I would say uh, 2021, there would be a potentially having a professional soccer team in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Not. Nah, what is, not what is Fort Wayne known for? Aside uh, from now, the <laughs> soccer club? We are known for uh, corn. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, man, it's a, it's, a, it's a city, man. You know, it's, you know, it's uh, a lot of hardworking people, nine to five. Um, it's a community city. You know what I'm saying? Everybody helping out each other. Um, it's a diverse community. We have we have the the biggest uh, Burmese um, uh, community in in the, in the United States, which is mm-hmm. which is which is pretty cool. 
So, uh, but no, we have a we have a lot of different uh, ethnicities in in, uh, in Fort Wayne, um, and I'm you know I'm just trying to bring football to everybody, you know. So hopefully they enjoy. Hopefully they enjoy last season, and you know they are looking forward to uh, 2022. And what's the plans for the future? Man, uh, a lot. Man, what is this? 2020? <laughs> why y'all inter- like? Why y'all interviewing me? He, he's interviewing 21 questions. Right? How about you go Goodness back? How about gracious. you take it back on him? Put it back on him. Flip it. Yeah. What, what, what on, you first, doing? First of all, why yeah, is your yeah, lighting look so different, Gooch? Where are you? You, you? Definitely not. You look like you're coming from a place that. Uh, I see. No, 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 no. You see, I, you that's know not I'm in the United States. You like, you like to deflect. You like to deflect. You know, like to deflect. everybody wants to know what's the reason why the crack took so long to bring back to bring back season three. And um, listen. First of all, I want to thank our listeners and all the supporters for the last two years uh, while we've been doing this, the crack. Uh, like we said, from the jump jump, this started off as just something organic for us to kind of shoot the shit and then talk, talk to each other about all the topics we do. Um, but, you know, after the pandemic kind of started phasing away a little bit, you know, things picked up. B started scouting, started tagging people except for me on, on social media. And, um, you know, myself, I moved back to Europe. So uh, since August, I've been back in Europe. I've been in Belgium uh, uh, running this professional team out here. So that's why I haven't been as accessible. That's why the crack hasn't been accessible. You know, everybody's doing uh, multiple things. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. But what are you doing? What's the name of the team and what is, what is your position? Mr. Oh, Clark? shoot. Oh, you want you give me the 21 questions now. All right. All right. So the name of the team is uh, our, uh, Virton, uh, or in French, Virton. Um, we play in the second yeah. division uh, in Belgium. Uh, my position is secretary general, which is the equivalent of a CEO. It's the same thing. Um, so I basically lead um, all operations in the club, in the company. Damn. So. I mean, I'm trying to be like bees. I'm trying to be like bees, honestly. Yo, I had to leave the country. Am, yo, I am nowhere near your level, bro. No, I had to leave level. the country to be like bees. Kudos to, to you. Kudos <laughs> to you. <laughs> nah, but it's it's it, it's great, great experience. It's good to be back in Europe. You know, bees. You've been out here for so long. When when you were playing, it's it's a different it's a different vibe, especially when it comes right. to football. So uh, I'm loving it. Uh, but now I'm even loving back being with you boys. Getting this going again, the crack, and uh, you know, that's my piece. What what about our host, <laughs> Mr. Mauricio Mookie Wilson? And keep Why it short. You, and you know, he tried to cut us out like Justin Timberlake. <laughs> he, tried to, he tried to go solo on the crack. <laughs> so I want you to tell everybody why you tried to do do this alone. Now, obviously, we all got busy and and things a lot of change in our lives. Obviously, again, like BZ traveling, Gooch going across the pond, and I was blessed enough to have my first child, uh, baby boy. And uh, so, thank you, Goose, thank you. Thank you, Uncle Goose, thank you, Uncle Goose. Yeah, so now I can jump into the, um, get familiar with what Beasley goes through um, with his, his baby girl. So, uh, you know, a lot of adjustments, but uh, we're excited for 2022. We have amazing guests uh, lined up, and one of the amazing guests that we have um, is here right now. And I just want to give a, um, a, a big round of applause and also a warm welcome to the new LAFC head coach, Mr. Stevie Chirundolo. Welcome, Stevie. Hey, what up, Stevie? I can't, I can't you, hear him. I can't, yeah, you can't you, hear you. You're yourself, Stevie. You need you to unmute yourself. What? There you Hi. go. Can you hear me now? There he is. Yes. There he is. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell was that? <laughs> that was Gooch. That was Gooch. I have no idea. Steve, thank you so much for joining wow. us. How are you feeling? I'm very well. Congratulations on the baby. So, thank you. Uh, I know it's uh, changes the household quite a bit, uh, <laughs> but all positive, right? Except for the sleepless nights, but I'm sure you'll be fine. Oh, man. Working through it. Working through it, man. Working through it. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. It's, uh, I was thinking about this the other night, and uh, Bees, when you reached out, and I was like, oh, I see all of these clips on Instagram or whatever, and I'm like, when, when, when are they going to call me? When are they going to call me? <laughs> well, I, I, I'll Appreciate be honest. Goose didn't want to have you on. So. <laughs> oh, Lord. Oh, this guy. He said, Here we go. Yo, Stevie, he said the right back, right center back connection wasn't really working. So he was like, eh. He said you never so got, know. he said you never tracked back. You never hey. looked out for him. Goose, <laughs> we, we know that's not true. 
There's no way. We all know that's not. We, we, no we, these ain't never had a. These ain't never had a right foot in his life. <laughs> right foot somebody to walk on. Yo, I just I just posted a right footed goal on Twitter the other day. Thank you. you I know you. I know you seen that shit too. Don't be. I know you seen. Nineteen ninety five. <laughs> hey, hey, Steve. It, you know, obviously, you know, you just got the job as a new LAFC head coach. Um, a crazy, crazy, incredible situation for your start for your coaching career. But uh, I want to start off as a player. What were these guys like as teammates? And starting with bees. Oh shit. <laughs> be honest. Hold, hold on. This, this the crack. You got to be honest. There's nothing uh, politically correct here. You know. No, it's fine. It's fine. Um, well, I got along personally with both of them, so I think most of my, my comments are going to be quite positive. Um, but I do, you know, Bees being an offensive player, myself a defender, we would have, have to get after each other and train a little bit. Um, in, in the beginning, he was younger. He was part of uh, um, the Bradenton crew, so you, you were in residency. And and I was a few years older, so I'm, you know, he had a little chip on his shoulder in the first couple of days when he came around with the national team. and. I guess I'm old school in that way, that I didn't like that. But then once I got to know him, and then <laughs> Thank you. Have, have, a few, have a few battles with him, I quickly understood, okay, I respect that because he works hard. He can take a kick uh, or a knock, and he's not going to bitch and moan. He's going to be all right. So uh, his my respect for him grew very quickly. And then the friendship grew over the years, so that the rest is history. But a lot of respect, a lot of respect. Um, very arrogant. So basically, basically, you said Bees was arrogant. Yeah, like, very <laughs> arrogant. No, I did not. Yes, say yes. That. yes <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> my, uh, my people skills were not as honed as they are now, so maybe I just misread the situation. <laughs> no, you read it. You read it just fine. That was everybody's impression of Bees. This little <laughs> bastard taking people's money and craps. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> hey, I, yeah. I used to, I used to gamble in my in my younger days. <laughs> I don't I don't do that shit no more. I like I like the, I like my money way too much. Now, now, obviously, you and Gooch played next to each other in, in some uh, some hard fought battles. Uh, what was it like uh, getting commanding Gooch and also getting instructions from Gooch? I mean, we can't communicate with him on here, so I hope he had a better experience on the field. You know. Well, I think uh, you know. I think we don't we don't change our personalities, nor should we. So I think what you're getting is what I got too. You get a strong, <laughs> you get a strong opinion, um, but um, you also get stability. And you get you get somebody who's willing to to put their foot down and to uh, draw a line in the sand, uh, which was how I saw him and how I felt. You know, somebody who behind me always had my back and was willing to do what he needed to do. Um, and me being a little smaller stature, it was important to have somebody behind my back a little bigger and uh, have bigger biceps than I do. So uh, <laughs> I much appreciated that. And it's the right message to send any team. So um, both of them were. Uh, I think uh, very fondly of our time together. We had a lot of fun. But hey, Stevie, I, let me ask I, you this. I'll go. Nah, go dude, let me ask you, Stevie. Was Gooch, was Gooch? Have you ever? Has Gooch ever said that he was wrong about something? <laughs> <laughs> ever? If it if it was yeah. a misheader, if it was a misheader, a mistouch, it was always an excuse. Why? Are you, why? Oh, can you let man. him answer the question? Can you let him answer the question? <laughs> I mean, damn. <laughs> Well, you're probably both right. He never actually admitted he was wrong, but if he doesn't say anything, that was enough for me to know that yeah. he, <laughs> he was wrong. <laughs> oh, oh my goodness. goodness. I hate y'all. I hate y'all so much. Uh, well, if you go if you're gonna talk trash about me like that, Bees, I need to know from Stevie how Bees was in Germany. Oh yeah. In Hanover. <laughs> I need oh, to know about shit. this. <laughs> You know, it wasn't just bees. I had I had Clint Mathis in Hanover. I had bees. Both of them were very long. Connor Casey was there as well. Wow, characters. Uh, oh, geez. All great people, uh, but all very different as well. Mm -hmm. um, and Hanover is is very different. It is not an easy place to play and to live sometimes. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if this is actually poor on me that I spent so much time there and good on you guys. You guys figured it out. Figured it out. But um, no, we had a good time. It didn't work on the field, and then I completely understood why. You know why he's left. The coach at the time didn't like him for whatever reasons. Um, timing is super important in this industry, and it either works or it doesn't work. And so our time there was shortened, but. Um, same thing on the field with the national team. We always had a good relationship and gelled, and um, I wish he would have stayed longer, but it did. 
Oh, I, I'll tell you this. Uh, one of the reasons why I never, I didn't stay longer is because you never invited me to dinner. <laughs> <laughs> no, you I mean he never invited you over the house? No. I, You're lying. I, I didn't hear that. There was I never an invitation. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was one of these. It was one of these. Hey, bees, um, if you want to go to dinner, oh, come over to dinner at my house. But, I, you know, I live about 30 minutes from the city. You're probably not going to like it. You know, it's, it's nothing to do. So, but I mean, if you want to come, it's okay. You you let me know. Hey man, Bees has been Bees has been telling this story for some years now. So you need to you need to clear this up because I need to know. Um, I vaguely remember saying that, but I believe yeah. you said that. Uh, and it's not all not true. We did live outside the city, but we should have connected more. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah, nah, nah. The the, the time was the, with Stevie was cool, man. Um, being in, cause I to be honest, the I was I was kind of blessed because I played with an American at every club I played I played at, and that's mm-hmm. really cool. every yeah, yeah. PSV? yeah every PSV what's that Man City yeah uh, Lee Lee Win Lee Win came in oh, for a little shit. while ah, yeah oh, so man literally City? every every huh Man City? Claudio Claudio oh shit yeah oh shit yeah so every every uh, European club I played at uh, I had an American with me so that was cool always always thought about that always thought about that so, so Steve oh, give us a little in- input on, on Hanover like you said it's a tough place or a different type of city um, people like myself have never been uh, how do you describe it Hanover is like uh, it's it's I think it's the fifth or sixth biggest city in Germany mm-hmm. um, which you probably wouldn't notice when you're, when you're there because it does feel small, like a small town. It has that family feeling to it. But it's also a city, so where you can still discover new places, get lost, and, and try new things, which I liked. It had the best of both worlds for me. Um, it felt familiar. Um, if you wanted to, you could see the same, same places, same faces, um, and kind of get into a community, which I did. Um, but at the same time, if you want to bug out and you want to be not noticed, you can as well. So. Um, it's uh, and it, it, no, looking through Germany, if you look at the north central part of Germany, people usually stick to themselves. Uh, when you walk down the street, probably not getting a lot of smiles or hellos or how you doing back. Uh, so people stick to their own business. And at front, it's very cold, but once you kind of break the ice a little bit and get to know people, um, very normal, very natural, very honest. Um, and for I got I got I got to cut you off real quick because. That description of people being cold in Germany sounds like the polar opposite of you as a person, right? Yeah. The, the, Steven, the Steven that I know is like, just like smiling, happy, joking. How do you even adapt to that kind of environment? I didn't. I felt flat, flat on my face in the <laughs> beginning, like with sarcasm, with jokes, with, hey, how you doing? And, and trying to get a little bit of, you know, trying to lighten things up a bit in the locker room. And then over, you know, the amount of time I spent there, we did, we had a really good culture within the locker room. Um, and it was kind of, I think the secret to our success of just light things up a bit. Um, I, I was not willing to change. And so some people felt annoyed by it, some didn't, but in the end, we won them all over. <laughs> yeah, I, I will, I'll say that about Stevie, uh, cause obviously he was a captain. Him and, um, hey Stevie, what was the, the the left center back's name? The kind of long hair. Ah oh, man, what was his name? Uh, Schulitz? Christian yeah, Schulitz. Schulitz. Yeah, yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. Because I was next to him in the locker room. Um, but yeah, whenever Stevie came in, he's, he always had a smile, making jokes, you know, in the locker room. And you know what I'm saying? You, can, you could tell like he brought that American, his personality to, to Germany. He's like, yo, I'm not going to, you know, become, you know, um, you know, kind of cold and kind of how the perception of uh, the German people are. Stevie was Stevie, and I, you know, I respected that a lot for sure when I was in the locker room. That's amazing, man. I mean, Steve, you had such a long and prosperous career at Hanover, but I know you, people ask this all the time. But I just wanted to know, like, um, were you ever tempted to leave, and how hard was it for you to stay so long at that club? I was very tempted, um, and there were attempts, there were opportunities as well. Um, no, no, no. You got to give us the names. You got to give us the names. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, when we were being promoted from the second division to the first division, uh, the, our, current, our coach at the time was uh, Ralph Rodney, who's now at Manchester United. And with a great season, um, he liked using the outside backs as kind of offensive tools, and so I had a productive season as well. And uh, it didn't go unnoticed, and so um, very close to signing a contract with Schalke. And, um, and then Kaiserslautern, uh, I ended up turning down at the end to stay in Hanover. Uh, Ralph uh, was very influential in, in uh, making me stay, or convincing me to stay, I should say. Um, 
because we kind of had, had built something and I wanted to make sure I was a part of that in the first division. So, um, you know, we all use these things in, in negotiation tables as well. So it worked out just fine. Um, and then there are options. I always wanted to play. Growing up, I watched, you know, uh, English football and I always wanted to go play in England. And obviously speaking English and being American, it was a natural move. Um, and it all panned out a few times. Um, so after after World Cups, I my contracts were usually up. I was free, and so I tried to get I tried to get there, and it just never really panned out for some reason. Um, but I think the main reason why I stayed was at the end of each contract, um, I answered a few. I didn't need to answer a few questions, and if I was able to with yes, then uh, then I wanted to stay. And it was was Hanover still growing financially? Um, was I still getting better as a player? And was I still growing as a person? And I was uh, able to answer all those with a yes. And so I just kind of figured out, listen, there's no reason for me to move. Um, I am getting better and continuing on my career right here. And the advantage of staying at one club is you develop relationships in that city, in that country. Uh, the disadvantage is you don't broaden your horizons at all. I would like to know, seeing your former coach now running the locker room with Manchester United, what first came to your mind as uh, what impact he'll make on that team, um, good or bad, you know? Oh, he's, he's uh, very analytical. Um, he understands the game very well. He's very smart. Um, he's very thorough with his work. Um, he will pay attention to all details. He's hands-on. I know his staff will be very hands-on. Um, he's also a, a good mix of, you know, he's like a, a hobby psychologist. And so he, he's <laughs> extremely good at speaking to players, understanding them, what motivates them. Um, how to get them? How to get them going and performing well? And so, um, really, just a very smart guy, mastermind. Really, um, I think he's going to do great things. Uh, when the players buy into his idea, that's a word. That's a poor uh, use of words. When they're convinced that his idea is going to work, mm -hmm. they will. Um, you know, they will go to battle for him, and they will be successful. I am one hundred percent sure. Hmm. Yeah, but it's saying that. It's saying, but it's saying that he only has what the six months, right? In, in May United. Um, so, do you think he'll have enough time to influence his style while I he's do. still at Manchester United? You're okay. I do. I think he will influence it. So, he'll get the ball rolling in that direction. And then, you know, it will be, as far as I understand, he will be remaining in the club and will influence in the club and what happens in and around the coaching staff. So, um, which what he does extremely well as well. He takes kind of a global view of things and is able to implement his own tools and his knowledge into the system. So, I think uh, once, you know, what, what, if he's there, he will be influencing the team and their performances. You know, I, I saw your press conference, and uh, one of the things that Stu Holden, Marisa Du, and those guys said was uh, they weren't surprised when they saw you transition from a player into the coaching. I would like to ask Bees and Gooch, did you see the same thing in Stevie? <laughs> that, that, when he, that when you... <laughs> you say, okay, I know he's going to be a coach one day because of his I'll, um, I'll, mannerism. I'll take this first. I'll take this first. I love Stevie to death. I think he was probably one of, if not the best right back I've ever played with in my career um, in terms of like the chemistry. Not that I'm surprised that he's a coach, but for me, your personality and you're such a people person, I would expect you to be somewhere more administrative. That's, that's where I saw your path, but like maybe the German structure got into you at some point and uh, you know, that's how you're kind of going down, down that coaching side. So me personally, I have to show him more administrative, but happy to see you as a head coach as well. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm, I am the same though. <laughs> I agree because your, your, your personality was so, you're so open that you could, you know, be cool with, you know, whoever it was on the field, you know what I'm saying? And off the field. So I always felt that you being more of a people person, you know, I thought it would be, you know, a, a sporting director, a GM, cause you got to work with the coaching staff. Cause you are in, in, so intelligent and so knowledgeable about the game of football that I thought that you could help on that side and, you know, help on the, the player side with personalities and being able to read people and getting, you know, um, cause sometimes, you know, players get tired of coach, the coach's voice. So being that other, you know, say that other voice in the locker room or, you know, around the team, uh, I thought that, you know, you would be in that kind of sporting director role, technical role, this and that, but man, I, you know me, I'm happy to see you as, back in America coaching and, you know, coaching one of the, the biggest clubs in uh, uh, U.S. soccer, the uh, United States. So that's, that's huge, man. You know, you guys are not wrong. 
Um, and so when, when you go through your licenses in Germany, and, and especially the pro license, it's, uh, I'm going to say, like, it's a 60% block of psychology, and you work with psychologists, and you break down your own personality, your characteristics, what you do well, what you don't do well. And, um, you know, not all coaches are the same, thankfully. And we all have different traits and, and qualities. And uh, for me, they told me, they said, you are just kind of in both worlds. You could do uh, the administration side or, or the technical side. Uh, you're kind of caught into both worlds. You're going to have to make a decision of where you go. And I feel the same way. Um, they told you that? Oh, yeah. They tell us they tell us all the time. And so this is, was their breakdown. It's like you, you are one of those guys who could be a sport director or you could be a coach. You have to figure that for yourself. But whatever path you go, you need to be 100% uh, involved in that path and you also have to understand that those qualities your players will also see and so you can use that to your advantage um, and it is that way so I'm like you guys said I'm pretty easy going I, I can fall into any crowd and feel fine and feel very comfortable uh, most people find it easy to talk to me um, but that can also be misunderstood and, and uh, used to their advantage so Having those qualities can be great, but you also have to draw lines and say, listen, yes, I'm approachable, I'm easy to talk to, but I'm also your coach, and you need to be able to do what I'm asking you to do. And so it's, it's a fine line, but I've had a few years, uh, you know, eight years now as a coach, understanding that and, and um, making sure that uh, that is not uh, being taken advantage of. When, when, when was it that you, in yourself, said, I want to be a coach, um, I want to take this path, you know, and just kind of go in 110%. I always, as a player, were fascinated with all the coaches I had, and the coaches we shared with Bob and Bruce um, and Jurgen. Um, and so and I always kept a journal on the coaches that I had, what they did well, what they didn't do well. And um, it's funny to look back to see what I thought then, what I'm thinking now, and what I'm going through now. But um, I always thought that was an option. And then until, not really until I retired and actually jumped into it. Um, so I retired in April, um, so just a couple months before the end of the season, just due to injury. And then I jumped straight into an assistant coaching job with the under 23s in Hanover. And um, instantly fell in love with it. I, I said, all right, this is a lot of fun, breaking down the X's and O's, um, trying to figure out drills to improve certain phases of the game or attributes to individual players. Um, and then have been going since. And so I really didn't know until I got into it that I wanted to do it. You almost fell into it by accident. Like by default, you, you got into that role and you didn't know if you were going to love it as much as you ended up loving it. And then it's just like, all right, this is it. Yeah, because I actually did some work for him over the time, um, kind of as a scout and was kind of going into that direction of maybe the sport director role. I had been on a few scouting trips to England and to France and then was moving in that direction. And then they said, hey, why don't you just go try some stuff on the field? And I did. And I said, you know what? This is kind of where I want to be right now. Um, and then being on the field, I've also noticed pretty quickly that I think I would struggle without that. So not being a part of, I don't have to be part of the locker room anymore. Um, I'm done with that. Uh, but being on the field and uh, making sure that we are all moving in the right direction and I can put my hand into that, that was very important to me. So you were, Stevie, you were the U15, the German national team coach, right? U15s? I just, or? so I assisted them. What the, way, the way the DFB works is they have all of these coaches that coach all of the youth teams and the A team. And then we collaborate like once a month and talk about topics and write curriculum and get together. Um, and then you're all kind of bunched in for one group of players as well. So my age group, our age group was the under 15s and I was assisting uh, the head coach for the under-15s and helping the DFB write some curriculum as well. Oh, okay. So was there ever a point in your mind when you were um, with the DF DFB, like, okay, I'm at the U15 level, I can go to U17s, U20, you know, and then obviously maybe one day coach the German national team, or was it always a dream for you to come back to America to, to, to coach uh, in the United States? You guys I need to hear that. this because I feel I feel like Stevie's German. Well, I don't know what. what, 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 what. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I just, I, I'm just curious, man. I, I'm just curious. I'm just curious. No, the, it, it was always my intention to come back. Uh, it was my intention to come back as a player. That didn't work out due to injury. Um, and then it was my intention to come back as a coach, for sure. Um, my, I have two kids, two little girls, and I wanted them to see where dad grew up and where he's from. 
and they are absolutely loving it here in LA, um, into the school system, dropping the German accents, they're like little Americans now, which, which makes me <laughs> very, very happy. My wife not so uh, much, but I am extremely happy. Uh, so it was always the plan to come home. Um, it's just a matter of time, and then getting through all your license in Germany is, is like a seven-year process. And so I just wanted to finish that first before I did start to move home. Stevie, what can we implement in our youth system that you saw, uh, that you learned at the DF, DFB uh, in this, Germany? This is, this is definitely a Mookie question. Holy shit. Yeah, this is a, all <laughs> Mookie. <laughs> It's, it's, there's so much involved in, in the youth, youth side of the game and the development side of the game. So there's, if you look at a different area, so there's one, the identification process. Um, I think that's the biggest animal we have attacking the United States is identifying our top players and making sure those players get high quality games um, week in and week out. And that is a difficult one to tackle because we are such a big country geographically. Um, and then you have the other side of it too. You have so many different um, entities who are all profiting from youth soccer in this country, and that needs to stop as well. So uh, it's a huge problem. I mean, pay to play is, is an absolute disaster, um, in, in my opinion. And I think. Tell, tell us how, only, how does it work in Germany? A little bit. We pay is players there, pay no, it, in Germany. Yeah. <laughs> so we. Um, you earn money as a youth player in Germany, so you don't have this amateur status that you, that you would give up your United States. Um, you're only a professional if you play in the first three leagues. If you play in, a, in the fourth division and down, you're considered an amateur player, but you can still earn money. So the money, the monetary side of it, is not attached to your status as a pro or an amateur. It's the level of play. Um, and so. You know, I think what the Germans do very well is they identify their top talents due to a selection process. It starts local and then regional and then it goes into your state and then national. Um, and they're very good at identifying the top players, getting those players into the best clubs, um, where the best coaches are, getting them high quality games week in, week out. So the players are when they are 16, 17, 18 moving into the men's game. Um, the, the tactical side of their of their game is already finished. There are no there are no holes in their tactical awareness. Um, the technical side seems to be fine. You know whether you're ready at 16 or you're 19. A lot of it has to do with personality and and character and Mature, maturity. And so there's no really shortcut there, but there shouldn't be any holes in the players' um, oh, tactical awareness, tactical development. Mm -hmm. uh, excellent, excellent, man. I, th I think you hit it on the head. Um, my next, uh, my last little Mookie question. They don't like when I ask like coaching questions and stuff. But my next little Mookie question is uh, comparing to the ODP system that we grew up in, and then now you have the academy programs. Um, do you feel that one is better than the other uh, in terms of developing the top talent here in the United States, or are we closer to the track of of getting similar to Germany, or are we further away? Um, it's a fair question. It's a good question. I, I don't feel that I'm. 100% qualified to answer the question just because of the limited time that I've spent back here and I've been kind of detached from the development side of the game. Mm -hmm. um, the, the one thing that I have seen, and, and maybe this one can help answer the question, whenever players have come on trial, American players to Hanover, I had a bunch, um, and then I would compare like a really talented 16-year-old to the 16-year-old German, uh, mentality of the American player was top physicalities, uh, the physical side of it was, was great, the technical side was, was, was good as well, but the tactical side there were some things missing. Um, and the reason for that is players between the ages of 16 and 18 in the United States are not getting enough of games at the highest level possible for their ability. And, um, and then the coaching as well. And so I think those games is what we're seeing that's missing in these players' development. Being tested week in and week out, week out um, against players of similar or better quality um, is very important in players' development. And I just don't think our top talents get enough of those games. Well said, well said. Now, coming back to United States, um, was this all a plan? Like, how, how far in advance you plan to come to Vegas and then take over the LAFC? It seems like it was a, a script. That, uh, I, I that need to know. Convention. I need to know why he left the German Federation for the USL. Well, he always wanted to come back. <laughs> hey, it was it was the, the poolside the poolside seats that they had at the at the lights game. I think that's what. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll say this: so 
Yeah, I love those. I love a few ideas. <laughs> like, so, uh, Brett Lashbrook, the owner, does a great job with that stuff. So it, it, definitely entertaining. If you're ever in Vegas and the lights are playing, go see a game. I got to go check uh, it out, man. Yes. As much as you can plan life out, um, this was planned, yeah. So um, it was certainly delivered in a conscious decision to get all of my license in Germany, get my first steps, work in the Bundesliga, work in the development program, be a very complete coach and have tried to do everything possible first before I came home where I could say, okay, I don't feel like anything's missing. I, I'm, I'm ready to go uh, when I coach at the highest level uh, or any level for that matter. Um, so that was accomplished. And then you have the other side of life that's uh, important, your family, right? Um, your kids and, and your personal side of life. I also found my wife and I, we kind of decided this was the right time to move. And so, it, things just kind of lined up professionally and, and personally things lined up and this was the right time for a big move. Um, you know, pertaining to LAFC, John Thorington and I, he says, hello guys. Uh, John and I yeah, have been in touch throughout this entire, uh, the entire history of this organization and we've been trying to connect and trying to, trying to get back and trying to collaborate and work together at some point. And then 2019 was the first time I actually stepped foot here. Um, I was in town for Ziggy Schmidt's funeral uh, here in LA. He's a legend. And, um, and um, I came down and saw the, the performance center in the stadium and I was just thrown away. I was blown away. I was like, this is amazing. Mm -hmm. And John and I talked and said, okay, at some point down the road, I'll finish my pro license and then maybe we can figure it out. Um, and then he gave me a call. I said, I got this opportunity. And he said, listen, you're probably a little overqualified for the job with the lights, but um, moving forward, we never know what's going to happen. There are no guarantees. And that fact um, that they were committed to me, obviously there are no guarantees in this business, um, along with the fact that my family and I were ready to move home regardless, um, we felt we felt that it was a great opportunity to take, and we did. I got, I got a question. I love being devil's advocate. Uh, and, and I love you, and I, I believe in your abilities, and I think you're going to do great in, in MLS and at LAFC. And when you spoke to John and he said, I got this opportunity for you. What do you say to people? Like when you said, he said, you might be overqualified for this, right? So what, not to, not to knock your, your, your experience prior, but like you hadn't played, you hadn't coached professional yet, right? And this is arguably a second division professional league. So why would he feel like, you know, you might be overqualified at this point? Well, I, I have done things that no other coach and worked in the Bundesliga for two separate clubs as an assistant, but being around a professional organization in the locker room was obviously not foreign to me um, as a player and then as a coach as well with two organizations, with Hanover, Hanover and Stuttgart. Um, I don't think there's a, an American coach out there who can say the same, um, especially at the USM level. Um, and so I think John was right in saying I was overqualified for the job. Uh, okay. Hey, hey, man. Hey, double hey, double, double down. Double yeah, down. Yeah, I love that. I love that. <laughs> but but Goose, that. some people might feel that he wasn't um, qualified for the MLS as yet, since he has no experience with the league. Um, you know, how do you? Because it's a different league. You know, we've seen so many coaches come in this league who are so um, so had so much success in Europe. And, and came over here and just you know just didn't get it the, the traveling from from one one side of the country to yeah, the but other I, the, but I, yeah no I, I know what you how, know, how you get think, players the frustration of having a salary cap um, the style I, of play I think I think you forget that Stevie's American so he knows the dynamic of you know the American player our our style our it's lifestyle um, you know what it takes to get the most out of each player or the American player. Obviously, you're going to be dealing with a lot of different, you know, foreign players as well. But, yeah. you know, uh, I think he knows the dynamic of an American player. So I think that's why he'll be successful in the league, um, you know, right off, right off the bat. Yeah, it's a very question. Get that contract. There are, there are you taking, you taking bees out of retirement? <laughs> <Was it? laughs> yeah, for sure. Get out of here. Preseason starts next week. <laughs> hey. <laughs> It's, it's a fair question because it is a different league and we have different rules here um, yes, you know, for, for obvious reasons, for good reasons. You know, the MLS was founded uh, 27 years ago or 26, this is the 27th season. And so, um, you know, we were all about slow growth and that's why rules were in place. And, and it's been fantastic and a lot of good decisions have been made. You know, at some point down the road, I don't know when that is, 
do we just kind of want to let loose and say, all right, let's let the Cubs kind of take the reins here and, and see where this goes? Absolutely. Um, I think that's where we need to go. Uh, but not my call. I have other fish to fry right now. Uh, <laughs> so, um, but I've always followed the MLS. You know, all of my friends have played in the league, um, being a part of the national team, you always follow the MLS. And, um, you know, have, working in MLS and following the MLS are two different things. But, um, you know, I have surrounded myself with very, very good people here at LAFC. Ante Razov is going to be staying on as assistant who has a plethora of MLS knowledge who I'll be leaning on very strongly. John as well. And so there's plenty of MLS knowledge in this building. But I think it's a nice mix and a, and a unique mix that I can bring my European influence in as well. Um, and then hopefully open up some markets and doors there as well. Now, um, LAFC is not rebuilding, right? That's just an organization that doesn't, you know, it doesn't really believe in that, especially at this time point. Will they give you the time for you to transition? I mean, do you feel pressure that you have to show success in the first two seasons or even the first season? Uh, yeah, I'll be very clear. We want to win games and as many as possible. And um, our fans demand that. And rightly so. 32-52 is, is an incredible atmosphere. Yeah, crazy. I've never seen a game yeah. at the bank. So, um, you know, rightly so. Uh, and I expect nothing less of myself and the teams that I coach as well. So I feel comfortable in that environment. Uh, you know, these two know as well, like being in a, in a cutthroat environment in European football for my entire career, it's just kind of second nature and natural. And uh, I, I just feel comfortable. I don't really feel that pressure. Um, if I do, I'll turn it into something positive. So. Definitely, definitely. A any exclusives on um, on plays you're going to sign? Because uh, everybody's wondering, um, you know, you can give us a little sneak preview, you know, drop us a hint, um, give us well, a name. What we're, tr what we're trying to do in the offseason, we're trying to inject this team with uh, more, even more character and personality and then more importantly, like a winning mentality. So with Franco Escobar, we have an MLS champion in line, right? Um, uh, with uh, Ismail Tajiri Shardi as well from from New York, we brought in, and so we're going to do a little bit of a little more of that. And I think we're trying to really balance out the central axis of our team, so center back six, and uh, and then another another attacking minded, very explosive <laughs> player. Gooch, uh, Gooch, Gooch, they like to, they like they like to play out of the back. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, wait, first of all, I know B's ain't talking. B's had to move back in his in his career. Oh my God! B, hey, hey, it's, hey, it's, it's, Steve, it's brutal here, man. It's brutal. It's brutal, man. This man played center back his last year. I know he ain't talking. <laughs> Steve is brutal. Oh man, it is. It's a tough crowd. Tough room. Hey, w welcome to season three. Welcome to welcome season, season three. <laughs> <laughs> But but real talk, who who are you excited to to really get out there and 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 work with and develop as a player on the team? Give me one name um, of a player you really. I mean, the, to. the obvious name is, is you know Carlos Vela is a fantastic player. Um, you know just the training session today, just jumping into the boxes and, and then seeing him make everybody else better. Um, you know his his football IQ is off the charts. His touch as well. Um, so working with him and then trying to make everybody else better around him at the same time. Um, is an interesting, uh, an interesting job, but I think a very rewarding one. So it's you, know, you have to be careful not to be too individual or just building a team around Carlos. No, um, and that's not what he wants either. He just wants to win games, and so I think kind of marrying the two is going to be interesting. Um, it's uh, a slippery slope, but it's I love challenges like that. He's a great guy to work with, um, very easy going, easy to talk to, uh, but at the same time we want to get the most out of him. And who who surprised you? Who surprised you at training? Like, oh man, I didn't realize this kid was. Even though you've been around the team, that right. you realize that you know this he's going to have a great year this year, two thousand twenty-two. Well, officially, we haven't started training yet. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is all unofficial. The CBA has very clear rules on this, so training will start next week, and I'm really looking forward. To, um, you know, one of the guys I had a little bit last year with the lights, and I, I expect to have a, a good year this year. Um, will be a Mahalo Apoko. I think he has a lot of tools um, and great guy. Super happy and just, yeah, funny and happy. And love having a good time. He really enjoys the game. He's playing this for the right reasons. So if Mahalo can at some point understand that, hey, this is also a job and a business and there's time to work and time to fight and scratch and bite, uh, he's going to be an excellent player. We're, we're gonna, we're, you, you'll enjoy watching him. Nice, nice. 
I got a quick question for you as you enter this helm of MLS coaches. How are you going to feel going into this season, going up against some of your ex-coaches and Bob and Bruce who have had, you know, successful careers in the league? That's fun. Yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting. Um, you know, their careers and their records speak for themselves, and they're both great coaches. Um, you know, I, I picked Bob's brain for a year here um, last season, and every morning he was in his office, and it was either it was, he was here first, and then I came in a little later, and I had a good opportunity to speak to him every day about my team, about his team, and, and just things in general about the past as well. And um, so now seeing him on the other sideline will be tricky, will be fun. Uh, but I know our relationship is, is solid and before the game and after the game will be just back to normal. But during those 90 minutes, I'm trying to win a game. And um, I don't care if it's Bob, Bruce, or whoever, so try to win a game. Nice. Nice. He brought that German out. <laughs> <laughs> he don't care. Hey, man, listen, I, I just, I just um, we want to wish you, obviously, the best of luck this season. We're excited to see uh, what you're going to add to, to the MLS League as a coach. And, um, you know, we just thank you so much for making time to, to come on here. And we hopefully that during the season we can have you back as well, uh, maybe mid-season, and, and try to see how, you, how, you, how things are going for you and how, how much you're enjoying it. But uh, definitely a friend to the show for sure. Thank you, guys. Uh, pleasure being no out here. Um, season three, I made it eventually. <laughs> yeah, hey, you the, you the top of the show. First, first show, first episode, season three. Uh, no, good to have but, you, man. But, but Stevie, Stevie, we had you on the list from last season, and I'm kind of pissed true. off that we didn't get you, you before. You no, 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 no. But here's the problem. <laughs> no, he's, he's not, no, this is the one time Mookie's not lying. I, I, want, I, want, I, wanted, not lying. I wanted to one make time. sure that you... Uh, that we had you before because it feels like now we just only interview you because you got the head coaching job. You know, we, we, we uh, myself as a fan, these, these guys as teammates, you know, always uh, spoke highly of you and how incredible you are as a person. So, you know, and we and always- the Hall of Fame. Know. And I mean, we're, we're, we're in the presence of a Hall that. of Famer right now. Yeah. I mean- That's right. That's right. right. <laughs> <laughs> Who's you next, aren't you? Boy, they set me up. They, said, they put me. In, they put me in the class with Beckham and Terry Henry. I'm like, good, good luck, Gooch. Like, you be all right. Uh, we'll, we'll get y'all in there, guys. Thank you for having me. I'd love to come back. Love you guys. Love your show. So um, keep up the good work, and uh, we will be in touch for sure. Appreciate it, Stevie. Much good love, Steve. man. Thank you. I'll put in a good word for you, the Hall of Fame boys. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thanks, brother. All right, you have it, man. The, the legend. This yeah, man. Wild. Stevie's a good dude, man. Yeah, man. Class. But uh, really good, man. And I think I like what he said uh, early on. He was talking about me, but I think it pertains to himself. You know, people don't change their personalities. I don't think Stevie has changed from day one that I met him till now. Talking to him, so has Beasley know, I changed? I wish him best of luck. Nope. Yeah, bees is bees is mean. Bees is just, just grump, grumpy. I, 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 yeah, okay, I'll give you that. I am more grumpy. I, I, I do talk a lot more shit than I do uh, than I used to. So, hey, fellas, man, before we leave, I want to talk to you a little bit about the African Cup of Nations, man. Everybody's been kind of up in the uproar about these guys um, having the. The, the tournament in the middle of the season, the European seasons. Um, if you look at the Twitter now. They always have it in the middle of the season. I don't know, right? And, and if you look at the Twitter now, people are saying that the, the games are crap and how uh, <laughs> there's no fans. Well, well, it's also well, 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 negative. Give us, give us the good, bad, and the ugly of the, the African Nations Cup right I, now. I, listen, first of all, the good thing is that, you know, it's a lot of passion, right? And, and these teams, um, you know, you know, these are opportunities that these players will never get, right? Everybody gets to the World, not everybody gets to the World Cup, but a lot of these players are going to get seen by European teams and get opportunities they would never have gotten playing in local leagues. But also, it's the first two or three days and everybody's like, oh, there's no goals being scored. Every major tournament starts out slow, right? These these players and these teams will get more of a rhythm and uh, and get more, um, adapt more to, you know, being in Cameroon and, and kind of playing on these, these fields and these stadiums, man. But... I'm just excited to, just to see these players that some of us have no idea who they are and they're going to make a name for themselves. But I have to say, I don't know if you guys seen it, um, the game against, uh, was it Mali in Tunisia? 
Oh, man. And the referee stopped the game in the 85th minute. Oh, my Yo. God. Gooch. I don't know if you saw it, Gooch, but I, I, I've, I've, I, I've been defending it. But, you know. This, How can this you referee, defend that? How can I, you no, defend I'm saying that? I was defending the referees walk, prior. Walk, walk me through it because y'all, y'all were telling me about this. I, I didn't have a chance. I, I just got home when you were telling so, me about this. Please. So the ref, I mean, first off. I'm not even going to go into the, the, you know, the, the amount of uh, the stoppage time for the water break in the second half, you know, the, the, the VR stoppage. I ain't talking about that. Yes, it, that happens every match. But, dog, he blew the whistle for the, fin- the final whistle at, in the 81st, 85th minute. He looked at his watch. No, <laughs> <laughs> he, he looked at his watch. watch he was, was like, bad. His watch yo, was he looked, bad. Yeah, he was like, oh shit, wait, wait, let, give me the ball back. <laughs> ball back. So, so he blew, he blew two he, whistles, and then wait, he realized. <laughs> yeah, so he got the ball. He got the ball. And he, you know, gave it back to Tunisia. Let him play. And then in the 89th minute and 40 seconds, he blew the whistle again. <laughs> 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 he stopped the game finally. But when he did it in the 85th minute, he realized he was wrong. He ran, got the ball. And B, you see him throw the ball in the corner? T- yeah. To the goalkeeper? <laughs> the, the goalkeeper's like, what are you doing? He gives the ball. He stops like he's going to do like a drop kick, right? Because he messed up. Then he like tosses the ball in the corner. Then he runs to the half, to the half of the field. But Yo, I'm crying. the worst part about it, Gooch, is that once he did that, he eventually stopped the game in the 89th minute, 45 seconds. There was two penalty c- kicks two VARs, a water break. And a red he, card. A red card. He tried to stop it in the 90th minute. <laughs> he stopped it early. You early. Know man had somewhere to be. He yeah, early. honestly. Was like, yeah. He was looking at it. He's like, yo, I got, I got to go. I don't know. It, was, it was definitely like a men's league local type of referee. Like, listen, man, this game is over. We got to go. But, but yo, catch a joke, though. So after the game, you know what I'm saying, the – the uh, the federation came into the came into the conference room while the Mali coach was giving the co- you know the the in the end of the end of the match you know com- uh, speech, right. speech. They came in and said no 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 stop this stop this we're gonna play the extra minutes no the I didn't see that part. yes yes they, they came in stop yeah they stopped the press conference and said look let's go back out to the field what? we're gonna play the next the next five minutes blah 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 and then Tunisia was like nope we're done we're not playing we're not we're not coming out the locker room. We're they're gonna, they're gonna protest. They're gonna protest. Yo, so the federation tried. They stopped the press conference of Mali and tried to get them back on the field to finish the game. So they know they was already wrong. Man, Yo, you, what's gonna happen? What's gonna happen? I mean, this ain't this ain't the first time dude has some con- uh, controversy. But yeah, what happened, like, Gucci? I think what happened. Game ends like that. Do, do you end it like that, or do they have to redo it? I mean, I, it is what a referee's know. discretion, but I think Goose, the problem that I'm trying how, to. No, how though? The, the game is 90 that's minutes. Not referee, that's not the referee's discretion. But here's what, probably, even... here's what I'm thinking referee made a mistake. In the water break, he didn't stop his watch. <laughs> that's the, it that's still ended I'm early. He still ended early. In the water break was seven minutes, so he didn't stop his watch. So. Why? No, why are you defending? Why are you defending this ref? Yeah. I'm just trying to set the mentality of him. Why? How would you ever make this mistake? That's he the only thing. He looked at his watch. He looked at his watch. Right. Blew the whistle. The 89th minute, and it was like, <sighs> yeah, he was so nervous, Scooch. <laughs> he was he like, was I'm so done. Nervous. I'm out. He was so he like, let me get out of here. This game is over. <laughs> get me out. <laughs> but yo, hey, hey, real talk though. We laughing about it. You know what I'm saying? But I mean, that's that 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 cost of Tunisia a chance to you know get a draw you know that country to 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 play in a big tournament and to 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 lose a match like that um yeah. Yeah. you know Six, that's, yeah. that's that's tough to swallow you know that's, i know we we can laugh about it we laugh about what happened with the ref but man that's um that that's crazy man i i really hope they how for one how I, I really hope they they ban the referee i don't know what happened oh, yeah, he's behind done. it yeah he's, he's got to be he's got to be he needed bad growth he needed bad but, that, but that's, that's just bad it's bad for football you know, yeah. to see that to happen in a, in a in a tournament like this, I mean, you can see it in a in a friendly match or something. But a, a I th- big, I think it's even it's even worse because people already have a negative stigma around exactly. the African Cup of Nations, exactly. and then you have this kind of you know official uh, uh, official doing this. It almost sounds like where'd they find this guy? Oh, yeah, you know, let's let's get this guy. You know, yeah, like he didn't go through any proper training or whatever. That's it's, that's it's, wild. I've ne- I've never seen that. Maybe in Fort Wayne. No. <laughs> Yo, Beast, nah, nah. he can never come yeah. to Fort Wayne, man. You got to make sure he no. gets jumped. If you ever come to Fort Wayne, man, you got to make sure that the locals um, see him out there. But <laughs> but, um, but I just want to do want to say that, you know, some of these games have been, you know, 
entertaining, right? And that's why I tell people about African Cup of Nation. Like, like there's CONCACAF games that are horrible. There's European games that are horrible. There's there's South American games that are horrible, uh, especially the first round. But um, you always gonna know there's always gonna be some type of drama in that AFCON game, right? There's mm-hmm. always be there's gonna be a red card. It's gonna be a crazy tackle. It's gonna be some type of wicked move. There's gonna be some type of expression. But you're definitely gonna have some type of drama, you know. And uh, I'm just hoping and praying. That um, you know they, they can keep on entertaining and, and the, the the TV ratings go up, so it could be a lot more supported in, in the next uh, in the next tournament. You know because um, we need this man. We need we need to make sure that um, it's on an equal stage as everything else, man. So and uh, Gooch, take us away, man. Well, I just want to say, I, hey, before you start, oh. I want to say we back. We, we back, back, baby. We back. We, we back, back. We back. We back. <laughs> you know, it, we had to take some time off. Take take uh, what they say take one step back to take two steps forward. And, uh, you know, the crack crew is back. Uh, we want to see you guys comment, like, follow us, tell us who you want us to get on the show. I don't care if they've been on other podcasts, cause you know, it's going to be different on the crack. So let us know. We're going to get them in here and we're going to grill them. So till next time y'all love. Hold you. on bees. He always got to grill somebody, right? He can't, why we can't just have a nice conversation with somebody. What you talking about? I ain't say, I ain't even say shit. I'm talking about Goose. Sorry, Goose. Why Goose always got to grill somebody, man? Oh, that's what we do here. <laughs> that's what we do here. That's what we do here. Oh, Come on man. now. You, you, you heard Stevie talking about all that trash about bees in Hanover. <laughs> <laughs> and bees, what you got to say, man? Uh, I ain't got, I ain't got shit to say. No, I'm what you always got to say at the end of the show. Hey, I'm just happy my, my internet stay stay stable. <laughs> what I miss? What I miss? Hey, I got hey, I got a microphone now. You sound better. My, my internet, my internet was stable, so I mean for me it was a good show. So I'm happy to be back with y'all, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, season three. All right, fellas, subscribe, like. What else, bees? Damn, man, how many times you gonna say it? <laughs> they got it. They got it. And we out. Peace.